When Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of King Herod, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is the newborn King of the Jews? We saw his star at its rising and have come to do him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was greatly troubled and all Jerusalem with him. Assembling the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it has been written through the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and ascertained from them the time of the star's appearance. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may go and do him homage. After their audience with the king, they set out. And behold, the star that they had seen at its rising preceded them, and it came and stopped over the place where the child was. They were overjoyed at seeing the star, and on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They prostrated themselves and did him homage. Then they opened their treasures and offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed for their country by another way. The Gospel of the Lord. Over the past few days, I was at a priest conference given by three spectacular biblical scholars, three like the Magi, you might say, and one of them said, just pay attention to the bombardment of signs, epiphanies that life and God always gives to us. And that's really what the solemnity of the epiphany is all about. People wanting and needing and looking for God along the journey of life that brings us back to Mass again today. Here's an example from this past week. I have no interest in football, but it was fascinating to read about the epiphany, the epiphany of prayer that resulted from the injury to the Buffalo Bills player, Damar Hamlin. And if you read the story, especially over the last day or so, it's a fascinating story, not only about what happened, but just the aspects of his life. And as he was carrying, being carried off the field to the hospital in Cincinnati, a huddle of players from both teams, the Bengals and the Bills, knelt down in a massive yet intimate circle on the field. They bowed their heads, some placing their shoulders around one another with tears streaming from their faces in a moment of spontaneous prayer led by the team's chaplain. The hushed crowd in the stadium burst into applause as the players knelt and again as they rose up. It was the first of many prayers in an extraordinary display, epiphany, revelation of public piety that has unfurled across the country, even to many of us folks who are outside of the sports world. The invocations on behalf of that 24-year-old player have gone way beyond the typical pro forma thoughts and prayers often spoken by public figures after a tragedy. Videos circulated online of Bengals in the fans reciting the Lord's Prayer beautiful witness of of people coming together. On Tuesday, I read a story online about an ESPN commentator who was himself a former NFL quarterback 
who just stopped talking on air about the accident and told his, his colleagues right in the middle of the live broadcast that it's just in my heart that I want to pray. And so bowing his head and closing his eyes, he did so. And he said, God, we come to you in these moments we don't understand. I believe in prayer, we believe in prayer, and we lift up Damar Hamlin in your name. And his co-anchors murmured, Amen. To outsiders, the intensity of these expressions of faith might seem surprising, an unusual display of public devotion in an increasingly, obviously, secular society. But as the New York Times editor wrote, to observers of the close relationship between Christianity and American football, the exhortations to prayer are pretty natural. And he went on to say, in part because of the NFL's racial diversity, the evangelical spirit within is less concerned with the culture war politics and more about applying the Bible. Applying the Bible understood through the evangelical lens of practical needs for the players and their families at their athletic performance, of course, their marriages, their families, situations in family life, addictions, and dealing with injuries and setbacks. So what does all this have to do with the epiphany? Well, I think it shows that we're all on this journey of trying to discover and find God together. And I think it connects to the basic human need that brings us back to church week after week of questing, questing for something more. God is here in the midst of our joys and also in the midst of our struggles. And so we have this beautiful story today. Putting one foot in front of the other, people have <clears throat> moved across the globe since the earliest days of human history, the journey. And like the Magi, human beings have traveled together for safety, for security, for support. Without the aid of maps years ago, it took a group, took a small group or a large group to navigate their way to the uncharted territories of life, of the journey. Stars, usually stars, but also trees and rivers and uh, these kinds of noticeable venues provided landmarks along the way where travelers could find their bearings and continue their destination to, where they, to wherever they were going. Today, solo trekkers uh, aren't unusual. Air travel allows us to cover the globe within hours on journeys that took years to accomplish a century ago. Armed with GPS devices and internet connections, people don't need to depend, we don't need to depend upon a star to find our way to our destination. Unless, unless some obstacle, some accident, something happens that impedes our day-to-day -day activity. So why do people restlessly move about the landscape of life? Well, each of us are here from different ways. Each person's uh, search differs. Adventure, solace, peace, uh, safety, physical uh, and uh, family ties, physical fitness, sports, all these and more are motivations that we as human beings, we as pilgrims uh, have. And, and we are next to each other, uh, on the road, on the journey, a different path, different meanings, but a true metaphor of each of our lives on the journey together in good times and bad times. And so the story of the Magi fits this quest for fulfillment and also for togetherness. That's why we don't, you know, just pray at home, especially as Catholics, we come to church and people in the stadium praying together, not leaving and praying, but praying together on the field in the stadium. So what was the journey of the Magi like? Well, it wasn't as ferocious as a football game, but the desert climate could be brutal with glaringly hot days and bone-chilling evenings. There would have been many stops 
along the way for the Magi, just as there are many stops for us along the journey of life. Others on the road would be acknowledged, food would be shared, camels would be rested, tents would be built, meals would be cooked. They didn't travel alone, or did they travel alone? We don't know. Did, they, did their servants come to attend to their needs? All those little details are left out of the story for us to fill in, not only with our own imaginations, but also with the situations that we face in life. If we think deeply about the underlying meaning of this story, as it was 2,000 years ago, as it applies to each of us on our journey of life. <clears throat> it's interesting that King Herod um, was, is right in the middle of this gospel. The reality of life, the reality of politics, the reality of um, this kind of person. And he's consulted the religious officials for guidance. At this biblical conference I went to last week, uh, the, one of the scholars said that Herod was called uh, the king of the Jews. So therefore he's hearing this about this other king of the Jews. Uh, but he wasn't even Jewish. He was propped up by the Romans to keep the Jews in place. And he was paranoid. And he had his wives and some of his children executed. Similar, as he said, to uh, Henry VIII. So the chief priests and the scribes knew where the leader was to come from, but they didn't seem to understand the significance of what that meant. It was the outsiders. It was the outsider from the East who understood, who understood the deeper meaning of a new narrative, a new story that involved another outsider of a non-priestly class, newborn, and yet of humble origins. Jesus, who brings us here today. Just like football players can have a deeper meaning and connection to the human struggles of life from a different vantage point. So Herod's response is very pivotal and interesting. It mirrors uh, so many um, world leaders uh, years ago and even in our own day, issuing public statements that aren't believed while harboring private thoughts, told, telling them secretly, go get the news, bring it back to me so I too can come and worship. Hidden agendas and using naive people to gain favor or information. Uh, these are the behaviors routinely of, uh, of, of many leaders, politicians in our modern world. How little things have changed over the years. Power grabs, shaky egos, the use of violence to instill fear among the people, among enemies. Herod's methods are unfortunately still making news today. But as Christians who follow the message of the Gospels, who bring us here today, we are called to be focused on the journey and not uh, to let the human darkness of other people out there, leaders or whoever it might be, and not to let the secularization of the culture dissuade us, deter us from following Jesus we're just turning to God, you know, uh, so that's why we're here, to turn to God. This path to the holy can be found in the most unlikely of places, not only in our worship spaces where human beings deem sacred in church, not only in the words of religious authorities, the chief priests and the scribes who claim to know the mind of God, not only in the observance of specific ritual, not only in the following of every iota of religious uh, rules, but the path to the sacred can also be found in our own spiritual deserts, in tragedies, and when things least expected happen. Sometimes it is the foreigner that speaks the truth we're too frightened to admit ourselves. Sometimes it's a little child who has the courage to say what others are unable, unwilling to express. Our deserts, our lives, can be full of loneliness, isolation, alienation, but nevertheless, like the Magi that come, they follow the star and they listen to the voice within. When we disconnect from our sacred path and no longer feel that internal compass is setting us in the right direction, Fear and longing keep us from seeing a fuller vision of divine goodness present with us, and we sometimes can miss the signs. So searching for our cathedral, searching for the church of the baby Jesus, can result in, as it did for the Magi, 
and the martyrs, the holy innocents, uh, in marginalization by the authorities because it may not, doesn't fit the convention. And just like the Magi, dreams must be respected and sometimes conventional secular wisdom ignored at times. Journey alone, and we go off, off on a path and we sometimes get lost in the weeds. But traveling together, as we are here in church today, with kindred spirits, even in the football game of life, we can experience the living Jesus and the Bible coming alive in new and deeper ways. Life is a pilgrimage, and the Magi teach us how to truly be followers of the Holy One. Isaiah says in the first reading today, see, look out, see darkness, covers the earth, and thick clouds cover the people. Yet upon you, upon us, the light shines. But it all depends on people, on us, looking up to find God in spite of the darkness that's still out there. And so as we begin a new year, let us, like the Magi, pay attention to the abundance of signs calling us to kneel, and bow down in homage before and to God. But also, let us pay attention to the dreams, to the voice of conscience, to the dreams within us that challenge us not to return to the past, to the Herods out there, but to take a new route returning home by another way on this journey of 2023. Amen. Happy Epiphany.